information for that week. These uh, last few months, it's, it's been such a delightful, comfortable situation, mainly because all of us are truth lovers. See, when you teach apologetics in this particular area of ministry, people either love you or hate you. Because you're constantly speaking out against things. You're constantly speaking out against falsities, against false doctrine. And when you speak against false doctrine, speak out against it, you name names because the Apostle Paul named names. He says, Hamanias and Pilatus have wandered from the truth. Their doctrine spreads like a cancer. Actually, he was much kinder or we're, we're much kinder than some of the things the Apostle Paul said. Because if we don't name names, how in the world are you going to know who's damaging the flock, who's damaging Christians by their false doctrines? So it's really been comfortable for me here because I know all of you, especially the pastor, loves truth. With that, we're going to talk about something that is the hallmark of truth. And that's something that most Christians will celebrate this coming uh, next week, actually. And it's what most of us call Christmas. significance of Christmas is completely lost, can be lost in the shopping malls and preparation for Christmas plays and all these other things. But whether or not someone celebrates Christmas, because there's churches that don't, because they don't like materialism and all these things. But whether or not Christians celebrate December 25th, the theological significance of what we celebrate should be known and embraced and not be forgotten. It's a celebration, which is the real meaning of Christmas. It's a celebration of God the Son. It's a celebration of this thing come on. It's a celebration of God the Son adding a new nature becoming flesh in order to redeem us. God the Word, the second person, the Trinity, He stepped out of, crea of, of heaven into creation. That's what we're celebrating. God the Son incarnating Himself, emptying Himself. That's exactly what we're celebrating. And the thing is, we should celebrate that every day. We should always remember what God the Son did on our behalf. He stepped out of His glory in heaven and stepped into this earth to become like one of us, taking on the very nature of a servant. The Incarnation now, keep in mind, there's some misunderstandings about the Incarnation. Even the, the phrase, Son of God, the word begotten, all these things. If we have time, we'll deal with some of those misunderstandings because it's very important that Christians be um, theologically aware of what we mean by these things. But the Incarnation, God becoming flesh, there's three essential theological points that we must remember about the Incarnation. Number one, it's an essential, non-negotiable part of Christian theology, thus part of the Gospel. It's part of the Gospel. You know, we can have disputations on secondary issues. You might have a different end time view than I do. You over there might speak in tongues, or you over there might think the number of the beast is 666, and someone else thinks it's 616. Uh, six, six. 
We can go on and on about these secondary theological issues. But when we're talking about essential theology, you got to be spot on. Sufficiently. There, these things have to do with the gospel. Namely, everything that has to do with the person, nature, and finished work of God the Son, Jesus Christ, is essential to faith. Not negotiable. You can't call yourself a Christian if you deny something essential about the faith. You can't call yourself a Christian if you deny the Trinity, because now you're denying how God revealed himself. You can't call yourself a Christian if you deny the deity of Christ, or God, second person of the Trinity, becoming flesh. You can't call yourself a Christian if you think your human works was the very means of your regeneration, or if you think a work is what got you saved. If you think water baptism is the very cause of your re regeneration, or if you think that meritorious works in some way, shape, or form is the very means or cause of your justification, the Bible recognizes one gospel, and that's justification through faith alone apart from works. And the very ground of our justification is the uh, cross work of Jesus Christ. So it's a essential part of the gospel that God became flesh, the incarnation. And the incarnation is a necessity to our redemption. And number three, the incarnation was perpetual. It's ongoing. It's not that he became flesh and like Jehovah's the Witnesses believe, his body kind of evaporated in the gases or Jehovah is keeping it for some later time. And now he's a spirit creature. Scripture opposes such a view. So the incarnation is perpetual and permanent. And with that, I'd like to deal with some of the places in the gospel and places in the epistles where this essential doctrine is explicated. I'd like to look at John 1, the prologue of John. Now, the prologue of John, even the first verse, one of my favorite verses, it, it refutes every single false doctrine that there is that has to do with the essential theology, that has to do with the person and nature of Christ. In John 1, 1, let's read it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and God was the Word. Virtually, most of your translations will basically say the same thing. In fact, the Greek text almost reads word for word. Except the last clause, as we'll see, where our English, because of subject-verb order, our English reads, and the Word was God. In the Greek text, it says, God was the Word. Theos, hey, halagos, God was the Word. Emphasizing the Word's nature, essence as God. But not identifying the Word with the Father, meaning he's not the person of the Father. John was clear on that. He left the article out. God was the Word, not the God was the Word, or he'd be teaching that the Word was the Father. We believe in the doctrine of Trinity because Scripture delineates it point by point, both in the Old and New Testament. In John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The first clause there refutes every single false doctrine that denies the eternality of Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was Verb there, it's in perfect in Greek, denoting a past continuous action. So in the beginning, there was no starting point to the word. That refutes the Jehovah's Witnesses. That refutes one is Pentecostal because they think the word is the Father. But we know because of John 1 6, 10, 14, and 18, and so on throughout his literature, that the word is Jesus Christ the Son. 
So from the very beginning, John refutes every false doctrine that denies the eternality, the pre-existence of Christ, right from the beginning. The second clause, and the word was with God. on they on, with the God, that's how it reads. The preposition frost denotes here intimate fellowship. The word from eternity had intimate fellowship with the Father. In fact, that phrase, with the God, Ostan Theon is used 20 times in the New Testament. 20 times. Every single time, but I think two times where the neuter is used, every single time, except those, I think, two times, it denotes persons who are with the God. Distinct persons. So the word from eternity was with the God. And then the, the last clause, John 1 1. C, as we'll call it. There's three clauses, A, B, and C. God was the Word. John puts God in the emphatic position in Greek. Theos, pain, stated perfect tense, always was the Word, as to the Word's essential nature. So here we have a beautiful presentation. In fact, we can just stay on John 1 if we want. There's so much to say. In John 1, 1. Through God the Holy Spirit writing through the means of the Apostle John, we know that Jesus Christ, the Word, was eternal. He was with intimately the Father for eternity, and He was Himself in the same category as God, as that of the Father. So, with that in mind, John sets his Theology, so there's no mistake. Jesus Christ was God, and it says in Him, he was, in Him was life. In verse four, and this life was the light of men. Verse three calls Him the Creator. Verse three, I like verse three because verse three says, John says, through God the Holy Spirit, all things, Panta, all things. All things through him have been created. <coughs> All things through him have been created. He's the creator of all things. But then we come to verse 14. Verse 14 defines what we come to embrace defines what we call the Incarnation. Is the word Incarnation in Scripture? Is the word Incarnation in Scripture? Is the word Trinity in Scripture? No, it's not, but we use these terms to define the Biblical Revelation. We use these terms to define what we can read, the Biblical data. John 1 14 defines the doctrinal word that we use, incarnation. Let's read it. Now I'm going to read it literally, as the Greek text reads. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory. The glory of the one and only, unique one. From the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh. This verb here, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or tabernacled among us. <coughs> Eskenosin, in the Greek text, which means, or derived as mean from the Hebrew, Satan, which defines and refers to Yahweh coming down to earth to dwell, as we read in Exodus 25, 8, and let them construct a sanctuary for me, says Yahweh, that I may dwell among them. Jesus' physical body, and this is important to understand, was not a temporary appearance. You know, we read the Old Testament, we, we read about the angel of the Lord, right? 
and we know without going through all the references, that the angel of the Lord identified himself as Yahweh. This is extraordinarily problematic for what is Pentecostals who deny the pre-existence of the Son. This is extraordinarily problematic for Jehovah's Witnesses because here you have the angel of the Lord distinct from the Father. Identified himself as Yahweh. He did this to Moses when he says, I am the God of your fathers. In Exodus 3. In Genesis 18 and 19. Remember we read about the three visitors? Well, one of those visitors or angels as we can read in, 19, in chapter 19, they were called angels, was the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is now identifying himself as Yahweh to Abraham. And right before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, in verse 24 of chapter 19, we read this. Now remember, before this, in chapter 18, Abraham met these three visitors. He wanted to wash their feet. They ate. The angel of the Lord was the speaker. He identifies himself as Yahweh. Then we read in verse 24. Then Yahweh rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh from heaven. Yahweh on earth did something on behalf from Yahweh in heaven. We believe in one God. But this one God has revealed himself as three persons. How is it that Yahweh does something on behalf of Yahweh in heaven? This is only consistent with monotheism in the context of Trinitarianism. Remember my last debate with the one this Pentecostal pastor, I gave this verse for him. He didn't even interact with it. He just said it's not, that doesn't read like that. It's not there. It doesn't read like that. I don't do that. Well, I'd say that too if I was the one that's Pentecostal. Yahweh reigns fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from another Yahweh in heaven. But yet there's one God. Only consistent with monotheism in the context of Trinitarianism. It's beautiful. The beautiful Trinity. So it wasn't the incarnation of Christ was not a temporary appearance or theophany or Christophany where he assumes a body for a particular purpose like the angel of the Lord at times. Angels did that too. No, this was permanent and perpetual. The word who was God, John said it what uh, he was, who was with the Father becomes flesh on our behalf. The apostle then positively affirms that the word was pre-existent, distinct from the God the Father, and absolutely God, and in verse 3, panta di alto againeta, all things by him have been created. And then in verse 14, John affirms the bodily incarnation of God, the eternal word, not as a temporary theophany, but rather, halaga sarks again to talk, the word flesh became. He became flesh. In verse 18, a couple verses later in the, of this prologue, which is one of the highest Christological prologues in the New Testament, John, Colossians, and Hebrews, John 1 18, no one has ever seen God at any time. Well, if Jesus was God, people saw him. John says no one's ever seen God at any time. How do we how do we respond to that? Well, obviously he's talking about the Father. No one's ever seen the Father, the Spirit. He did not become incarnate. No one's ever seen the Father at any time. The only begotten God, or the one and only God, the monogamous Theos, who is, no, I emphasize that because, as we'll see, 
this is another point of this, of this prologue that shows clearly Jesus Christ pre-existed. Who is at the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. No, no, all of our texts say who is. Who is at the bosom of the Father. So no one's ever seen the Father except the monogamous theos, the one and only God who is at the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. By the way, the, the, the term explain, he has explained him. Jesus reveals the Father. It is exegesita, where we get the word exegesis. Jesus exegetes the Father. He reveals the Father. He is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He's the revealer of the Father. No one's ever seen God at any time except the monogamous theos, the one and only God, who is. This, this phrase here, who is, comes from the Greek, ha'on, it's a, I'll say what it is and I'll explain it. It's an articulate, meaning it has the article. Present tense participle, own. The participle own denotes timeless, in these contexts, timeless existence, who always is. He always is at the bosom of the Father, not at one time after his incarnation. It says he always, Ha'on, always at the bosom of the Father. It denotes timeless, ongoing existence. In fact, we see the same thing in Romans 9, 5. We see the same phrase. Christ, according to the flesh, who is, that is, the one who is always being, Overall, God bless forever. We see this phrase in Exodus 3.14. When Moses was having dialogue with Yahweh, who we read in the beginning was the angel of the Lord. And Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament which the Apostle and Jesus used. In fact, most of the Old Testament quotations in the New was from the Greek Septuagint. We read in Exodus 3.14 Yahweh says, Ego eimi, I am Ho'on, the one being. The same phrase used of Christ in John 1.18 the same phrase used of Christ in Romans 9, 5. He's timeless. He always is, was there, as John says in John 1, 1. In the beginning, the Word was always there. And He was always at the bosom of the Father. And He's always, in Romans 9, 5, God blessed forever. John 1, 14 is the basis for the Incarnation, but also we see the Incarnation, the importance thereof, in the epistles. Last week we talked about the Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ as God, where in verse 6 he makes the affirmation, who being in the very nature of God, who parkum, who being participle there, in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God to take advantage of or use for his own independent advantage. And in verse 7, we see the incarnation, who was always God in verse 6, in verse 7, but emptied himself. <coughs> we talked about the reflexive pronoun where the subject actually becomes the object. He did it to himself. Christ, who was always God in the nature of God, says Paul, emptied himself taking this is the very means of the of the emptying taking the form of a bondservant being made in the likeness of men being found in the appearance of a man he himself humbled himself we have a reflexive pronoun there again he himself humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on the cross for this reason god highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name 
that caused their so damaging to the Jehovah's Witnesses that they had to add other here. So their translation reads, because they're Unitarian, they deny the Trinity, they deny the deity of Christ. Their translations, translation says, the New World Translation, and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. They're so deceptive. In the very beginning, they used to have brackets around other. Well, they, let me take that back. The origins of the New World Translation, I believe, did not have the brackets. They wanted you to think it was in the text. Well, they got caught, or they must have been ridiculed, because then in subsequent translations, they put brackets, same with Colossians 1, 16 and 17, around the word other. So you know that, that the translator put it there. But in the 2013 edition, they removed the brackets from all these places, same with Colossians 1, 16 and 17, so we read that Christ created all other things. Because if you leave the text alone, it's most damaging to your theology of your, your Jehovah's Witnesses. Because it says Christ created all things. He's the name above every name. In order that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bend and every tongue will confess that Kyrios, Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it reads. Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Paul, as we saw last week, is citing Isaiah 45.23, which is a prophecy about Yahweh, in which every knee will bend, every tongue will confess of Yahweh, and he applies it to Christ in Philippians 2. Of Christ, every knee will bend, and every tongue will confess that Lord Yahweh, Jesus Christ, to the glory of of God the Father. And it was Yahweh who emptied himself by taking the very form of a servant. And if you remember the such an awesome parallel that Paul makes, even using the same form of the verbs in Colossians or 2 Corinthians 8 9, related to the incarnation and glorification of the Son. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, now we have a participle there, which literally would read, though he was always being rich, meaning rich in glory. And we parallel this with Philippians 2, 6, although he was always being the nature of God. You have two participles denoting his eternality as God. Though he was always rich, the participle own is used that we just talked about. Yet for your sakes, he became poor. In Philippians 2, 7, for our sakes, he emptied himself. See the parallel? He became poor, meaning he emptied himself that you through his poverty, through his incarnation, his emptying, might become rich, glorified, righteous, through the incarnation of God the Son. So number one, we see it's part of the gospel. In fact, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.8, he says that Jesus Christ was a descendant of David according to my gospel. Jesus Christ was a descendant. The word descendant, spermatos. It doesn't get more literal than that. Nothing figurative about it. And Paul says this according to my gospel. The necessity of God becoming man. In Psalms 49, 7 and 8, we read, No man by any means can redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is too costly. No mere man can redeem anybody. 
John Wilkes has called Jesus the ransom, meaning he ransomed for Adam only. Well, David says no man can ransom anybody. Nobody. But Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, so his redemption, his ransom, was had infinite value. No mere man can do it, but God can do it. As perfect man, Christ lived the perfect life, fulfilling the covenant of works, something that we couldn't fulfill because keep in mind the law required perfection, not getting most of it right, but perfection. But he fulfilled the covenant of works on our behalf. Adam couldn't keep it, to which all humans are related to. So Christ is the second Adam, meaning that he met all the requirements of the justice of God, not only in his vicarious drugs work, but in his perfect and substitutionary life on our behalf. That's why Paul says in Romans 5, 1, we're saved by his life. He lived the perfect life that God required, but he did it vicariously on our behalf. And he took the penalty, something we couldn't pay, but he did it vicariously on our behalf. This is the ground of our salvation. We sit here before the Lord, saved and redeemed and justified because God became flesh and lived the perfect life on our behalf. He died taking the full payment of sin, on our behalf. He averted the wrath due our account because of sin. So 1 John 2, 2 is all about. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, don't sin, but if you do sin, we have an advocate, Paracletos. We have someone called to be alongside of us. He is he is not will be someday or potentially or hypothetically he is in verse 2 our propitiation he is our atoning sacrifice it was a definite atonement not he will be he is our atoning our halasmos our atoning sacrifice propitiation he forgave sins but also he averted the wrath of our account. Twofold. Keep in mind. Entrance to heaven. Entrance to heaven does not come does not come by just because you don't have any sin or your sins were paid for. Yet be righteous. And the God man provided righteousness that the Father imputed to our account. That means we're saved by the triune God. God the Father said, God the Son to become flesh in which we celebrate. We should celebrate this all the time. Die, averting the wrath to our account, imputing this righteousness to our account, in which our sins were imputed to him, to his account on the cross over 2,000 years ago. That's why we're righteous and our sins are forgiven. Not just our sins are forgiven, but we're righteous. Credited as righteous. So the, the incarnation is part of the gospel. It was necessary that God became flesh in order that he redeem us. He had to live a perfect life. He had to die in terms of his humanity died, his deity didn't die, his humanity died, he had to die. In which he can tell Mary, I have not ascended to my father, and your father, my God, and your God. If Jesus is God, why does he call God, why does he have a God if he's God? And you'll get that objection from Muslims, from Jehovah's Witnesses. If Jesus is God, why does he call God, God. Why does he have the God? Well, it can be answered, well, many different passages can answer that. But number one, 
When we say Jesus is God, we don't mean he's only God. He's God man. Psalms 22.10. He says, from birth, you have been my God from my mother's womb. As man, he can call the father his father and God. But as God, he's called evil. But as man, he's his God. That's the beauty of the Trinity. Because that's what scripture teaches. Number three, our last point. The incarnation was perpetual. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. Does Jesus right now have flesh? Yes. Does he have a flesh body right now? Yes? No? I ask, this, I ask this question all the time at churches. Because of we'll see, it's so essential. It, it's a, as John will, we'll see, as John says, it's a, literally, he sees it as a test for Orthodox Christianity. The incarnation, as we see in Scripture, was perpetual. It was ongoing. In Acts 17, we find that there, we read that there's going to come a time when God's going to judge the world by the righteousness of his son, the man, Jesus Christ. Feature reference to the humanity of Christ. Who's our mediator right now? Thousands of years after the ascension of Christ, over 2,000 years, who's our mediator? Jesus. First Timothy. What? Two. There's one mediator between God and man. One mediator between God and man. Who is it? In 1 Timothy 2 5. 2 5. One mediator between God and man. The man, the anthropo, the man, Jesus Christ. He's God and man right now. Colossians 2 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of God in human flesh. The book of Colossians is a anti Gnostic polemic, meaning it's a refutation to this heretical group, the Gnostics, from the, the word the word knowledge, because they felt they had superior knowledge. And they denied matter. They deny the physicality of the world. It's not an illusion, or it did not exist, or it's inherently evil. Nevertheless, if you deny flesh, you deny that Jesus Christ became flesh. That's how heretical it was. You know who embraces Gnosticism today? The Christian science. They're the modern Gnostics. Christian science. They deny all matter. That's why they call their people practitioners that they send to your house when you're sick to convince you you're not really sick because your body really doesn't exist. But I never met a Christian science that doesn't brush his teeth. So the book of Colossians refutes this whole dualistic theology because they believe that God was purely spirit. He existed in the fullness and out emanated from the fullness these lesser gods or demigods. And they believe the further away these Eons, as they call it, got from the fullness or went from the fullness, the more evil they become. And they believe it was this demiurge, this evil eon that created matter, the earth. Many Gnostics believe that. Paul sharply refused this whole notion. Because Paul presents Christ as, in verse 15, the image of the invisible God, the icon, the image of the invisible God. He presents Christ as the creator of all things in verse 16 and 17. By him all things were created. Heavens and earth, visible, invisible, but the throne, dominions, powers, authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. 
He uses four different prepositions to express in the strongest way that Christ is not an eon. Christ is not only the Redeemer in verse 14, the image of the invisible God, the Father, but he's the creator of all things. So strong is this argument. That he uses four different prepositions to prove it. So strong and expressive are these terms that, as mentioned, Jehovah's Witnesses had to change it because every time you see all things in the text in 16 and 17, they write other, all other things. And they don't have any brackets anymore. But they want you to think that it's really in there, that it's really in the text. Accept it. Because if Jesus Christ was the agent of creation, what would that say? It would say he's God. He's God. Only God is creator. And through him, Paul says, we have redemption, verse 14. So he's the image of God. He's the creator. And through him, we have redemption in verse 20 and 21 through 22. By making peace through his blood. Notice the physical terms he uses to refute the Gnostics. Having made peace through his blood, shed on the cross, in verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, verse 22, but now he has reconciled you, brought you to harmony by Christ's physical body through death. Oh, that refuted the Gnostics. Through his death, through his physical body, through his blood, Paul was writing by means of God the Holy Spirit. And Paul uses these physical terms to refute the Gnostic idea that denied what we celebrate, what we should celebrate every day. And then in verse 9 of chapter 2, after he so eloquently defines Christ as a redeemer, by his blood through his death as the creator of all things. In verse 9 of chapter 2, in him, Christ, presently and continuously, permanently, he uses the term katoike, always in the present tense, always dwells. Pantoplema, all the fullness, in all the fullness. This was the term the Gnostics used, pleroma, the fullness. Remember, they thought the supreme God lived in the fullness. But Paul says Christ continuously dwells in all the pleroma of the what? The theotetos, the deity. Or as Thayers puts it in his lexicon, the state of being God. He always is dwelling in the state of being God, theotetos. How does he dwell in the state of being God? In bodily form, says Paul. Somaticos. In bodily form, namely Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Therefore, against the Gnostics and other places, Paul stresses in the strongest way that the person of Christ Jesus permanently dwells in the fullness of the deity in bodily form. In our last passage, to prove the perpetual incarnation that it's ongoing, comes from 1st and 2nd John. In these two epistles, we find the same polemic, meaning John was refuting this brand of Gnosticism, the Docetic Gnostics, who thought everything was really illusory. It was just, it was all an illusion. The word docetic means, from the Greek, tokin, dokin, everything seemed to be real, kind of looked real, but really wasn't. It's just really interesting that most of the epistles are refuting a particular heresy. Most of the epistles were written for a purpose, for that purpose, to refute and undeceive the church. Because the church was being influenced, just like today. They're being influenced by every wave of doctrine that comes along. They're being influenced by everything. 
1st and 2nd John, by way of the Holy Spirit, addresses the problem of Gnosticism and this horrible doctrine that denied flesh. The Incarnation for John was the ultimate test of true orthodoxy, as he provides a very sharp reputation against these flesh-denying Gnostics. Two passages we'll look at. Um, this is especially seen in 1 John 4, 2 and 3. In verse 1 he says, of, verse, of chapter 4, Dear children, don't believe everyone you hear. I paraphrase. But what? Test. It's not a bad thing to test. In fact, we're commanded to test all things. We're commanded to watch out for false prophets, says Christ. We're commanded to do this. We're commanded to judge doctrine. Don't come at me, I didn't write it. We're commanded to judge doctrine, are we not? We're commanded not to judge inwardly. That's an unrighteous judgment. But we're called, commanded by God to judge doctrine. How in the world are we going to help people if we don't judge doctrine? Apologetics is a defense of the truth. The Church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 was commended by Christ for testing apostles and finding them false. Try doing that at a lot of large churches today. Ladies and gentlemen, there's an apostle who calls himself an apostle. He's false, and here's his name. <laughs> That'll be the last time you'll ever speak there. But yet, the pastors at Ephesus was commended by Jesus Christ for finding them false? Commended by God in the flesh. Good job. I know your deeds and your perseverance, and you have not grown weary. I know your, your kapas, your toil, your painful toil, finding apostles false, the claim to be apostles. Hmm. That's a huge thing, that God was actually pleased that we're commanded to do so. To always do so. So test everything, everyone in here. And then in verse 2, by this you'll know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This spirit is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, if you look at verse 2, when it says, Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come. The word, the, the phrase has come, comes from one Greek word, Eloi Luthata. It's a imperfect or a perfect tense. What's a perfect tense? Past action with continuous results. Jesus Christ on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. Perfect tense there. Meaning this past action of his work is finished for all time. That means today someone can be saved, they put their faith in Christ upon his work over 2,000 years ago in the past, but yet today they can be saved. Perfect tense. Past action with completed, continuous results. You know what we have here? A perfect tense. Alleluia. So literally, every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come, incarnation, and remains in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in remaining in the flesh, perpetually remaining in the flesh, not had flesh at one time and kind of got rid of it. Now he's a spirit preacher. No, John says, Whoever doesn't confess Jesus Christ and his perpetual incarnation come and remains in the flesh is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Spirit of Antichrist. That's how bad it is. According to the apostle who wrote. Remember, the apostle was carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's how important it is to embrace that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh right now. John expresses the same thing in 2 John 1, 7, 
where the present active participle is used to express the same thing. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming, participle here, and remaining, in the flesh, whoever doesn't do this, who toss esti, this is, he is, the deceiver and ha antichristos. He's a deceiver and the antichrist. Not a antichrist, not even just the characteristics of that the antichrist. John said, he uses the definite article there. He says, if you don't confess that Jesus Christ has come and remains in the flesh, not only are you the deceiver, you are the antichrist. That's how important it was to John, thus important to God, since God moved John to write and say what he did. The Antichrist and the Deceiver is someone who denies the perpetual incarnation. Just in closing, Scripture stresses in most expressive terms the necessity and importance of the incarnation, knowing and understanding that Jesus Christ, God the Son, became flesh. That means for us, we must include it, since it's important to God, the Holy Spirit, that he's always in the flesh, he's God in the flesh. We must include it in our public proclamation. We must include it in our private witnessing to somebody. This is what was important to God, the Holy Spirit, that the Son, Christ Jesus, God in the flesh, the Word incarnate, remains in the flesh for our behalf. Because he became flesh, he is our prophet, he is our priest, he is our king, he is our advocate, he is our mediator, only because he became, became flesh. He actually, actually substituted himself on our behalf, not a grand hypothesis. He actually substituted himself on our behalf because he became flesh. So we should always celebrate and be thankful for what God the Word became on our behalf over 2,000 years ago. He came to dwell among us. He came to provide redemption. He became flesh in order to provide propitiation, averted the wrath that was due to your account, our account, because of sin. To live the perfect life as a man, God in the flesh, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you saved us. We thank you that we're regenerated in which we have the ability to hear and believe and embrace these precious truths. Therefore, let us be fully aware of what we celebrate, not only this week, but what we celebrate, what we should celebrate, always celebrate throughout our Christian life, God with us. Lord God, let us include this, let us not be shy, let us include us in our proclamation that Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, stepped out of glory, eternity, and became like one of us, emptied himself, becoming poor in that sense, so we can become righteous, glorified. We thank you, Lord God. For all that you've done for us and then the son himself provided the redeeming cross work on our behalf so let us go with that in mind as we pray all these things in the name of christ the lord jesus yahweh in the flesh our mediator and our priest our substitutionary atonement amen <clears throat> Would you stand, please, as we sing the bond of love, number 544, by this.